Hi everyone, this is Neil Reiterter, also known as the Wax Whisperer. Thank you for joining me in my latest video. We have here a very complex case of a patient who needs to attend quarterly to have both their ears cleaned. I'm just commencing with this there right ear, and believe it or not, this is the better ear out of the two. Um, however, this ear is extremely complicated for the primary reason that they suffer from otitis externa. Now, otitis externa is an infection or inflammation of the outer ear. We have four parts to our hearing pathway, really, or you could argue even five parts. The first part is the outer ear. So the outer ear is the ear canal, the outermost layer of the eardrum, and also the cartilage on the either side of our heads, uh, the satellite dish, what we call the pinna. You then have the middle ear. So the middle ear is made up of the remaining two membranes of the eardrum. Uh, it's made up of the three hearing bones called the ossicles, um, more commonly referred to as the hammer bone, an anvil, and the stirrup bone. Medically, they are uh, known as the malleus, incus, and stapes. And within the middle ear, we also have the eustachian tube. The eustachian tube is the pressure equalizing tube in the ear. Uh, it connects the middle ear to the back of the nose, the nasopharynx. And the eustachian tube also acts as a drain pipe, so it allows the drainage of any fluid that accumulates behind the eardrum in the middle ear. Then we have the inner ear. So the inner ear consists of the organ of hearing. The organ of hearing is called the cochlea. It's a, it takes the form of a snail in, in shape and structure. And we also have the, the balance organ, the vestibular organ called the semicircular canals, and there's three of those in total. They are connected to the auditory nerve, the hearing nerve, and the hearing nerve travels up the auditory brainstem, so you could argue that's the fourth region of the ear, to the brain. Um, where it's processed, uh, more specifically in the auditory cortex, especially if it's speech being processed. So it's quite a complicated, intricate pathway that sound has to travel through in order for our brain to process it. So when we say otitis externa, it means an infection, or as I said, inflammation of the outer part of the ear. And in this particular patient, they have, uh, they are continuously uh, receiving treatment for this, but. Um, unfortunately, it's something that we just have to manage for the patient. They have seen ENT, they have seen dermatology. It's just, it's nothing, there's no real cure as such. And what happens uh, in this case is that because of the eczema, because of the dry skin that dies, um, it doesn't migrate and it collects in the air. And you can see here, I'm having very, uh, uh, very much difficulty in inserting the suction tube even through the ear canal. So, because this patient's got a lot of edema swelling as well of the ear canal due to their otitis externa, so it's just a buildup of excess fluid within their cells in the um, auditory canal walls, which causes the ear canal to be swollen, and we call that edema. Um, when we're suctioning, the fluid within the cells of the auditory canal get attracted by the suction probe, so in essence the suction probe begins to suction the ear canal and the ear canal collapses, it tries to enter the tip of the suction probe and it causes great difficulty in entering the ear. It is quite painful for the patient as well when the ear canal collapses. Um, so I had to stop uh, and I'm just relying now on the fine end, with the fine end suction probe, because it's got a narrower tip, there's less suction power per se. And uh, therefore it's less likely to, to cause a uh, collapsing of the ear canal. But it makes it more difficult to remove the wax. I need that additional vacuum power here to remove this piece. So I've decided to use a hook and I'm initially just rolling this forwards until there's a moment, and here it is, where I can get the hook fully behind this keratin plug and wax plug and remove this out of the ear. And when we re-enter the ear, you'll see this patient's ear is very narrow here, then it widens, it protrudes outwards. And that's what makes this case extremely difficult. That plug of debris, skin, wax was larger than the midsection and the outer section of the ear canal. So we're having to pull it through. Um, just going back in, just going to mop up some of this dead skin. The patient did experience some vertigo. They haven't in the past. Uh, they've been coming for several years, but uh, especially in their left ears, so if you stay tuned, I actually performed the procedure in the left ear first when the patient attends, that was their worst ear, but 
for the purposes of this particular video, I've decided to show you the right ear first because the left ear is a lot, lot longer in duration. And I don't want to bore some of you with it. Um, if it, You might find it a bit too long. So some of you, I'm sure, will enjoy the entire video. I'm just peeling away some of this excess dead skin. We're going to be careful to avoid any clarinetting. Clarinetting is when the skin, as we're su suctioning it, it begins to violently flap at the tip of the suction probe and that emits a very loud high frequency squeal. It's not only loud for the patient, it's also loud for myself. Whilst you're watching this, it's just a quick um, uh, request, if anything. So at present, the request goes out to any of my existing clients. I feel it's that's the best way. And I'm inviting one of my existing clients, and I know a lot of you uh, do watch my videos, if you want a free earwax removal, um, next Monday, um, the 20th of March, I've just got to get my dates right, yes, 20th of March, um, I'm having the um, ITV News Central, um, it's a, it's a news, news program, visit the clinic, they want to talk to me about earwax and the current position of earwax removal in the UK currently and um, as part of that we're hoping to um, have some footage of me performing the procedure on a patient now we won't be charging uh, the patient for this treatment if they uh, wish to attend of course it means you're going to be on tv so uh, do you have a think and if you are interested do give us a call or give us an email you, you if you want to buy this in clients, you, you know our number and you you know um, how to contact us. If it transpires that I'm not able to uh, get an existing client, then I will open up the request to uh, new patients who wish to be treated. But um, And for the ex existing client, uh, I'm more than happy to visit the clinic first, just so I can examine the ear, just to make sure there is earwax, or if you are able to visit your GP nurse prior to attending, that'd be great. So we're just moving on to the patient's left ear. This is the worst out of the two. And this ear was, the, 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 the dry skin, as you can see, was far more severe. There was a lot more edema. The main issue with this particular ear, uh, especially when compared to the right ear, is that this debris is a lot softer. It's more mushier. It's, it's got this mashed potato type of consistency which is the worst type really is it's so difficult to remove and it's actually also impacted on the eardrum so I found this extremely challenging as I always do when this particular patient books in I we have a note on their file to allow myself 45 minutes to perform the procedure because sometimes it can take that long and I'll just put that in perspective um, although I allocate half an hour as standard for any patient that attends to have their earwax removed just in case there's any complications and it takes longer. The average earwax removal, I would say, is probably four or five minutes, give or take, per ear, so about 10 minutes, I would say. Uh, quite often it could be a lot quicker as well. But with this particular patient, uh, I need that additional time. And a lot of it is because, and you'll notice it in this ear more than the right, I'm having to con continuously go in and out of the ear, and that's because the suction probe keeps getting blocked because I'm having to use the fine end. If I use the big suction probe, which I am trying to do here at the moment, you can see the ear canal collapses. I just can't get in. So as I try my best to enter, the canal gets vacuumed up by the suction probe. So again, I'm having to revert to the fine end. I think, actually, before I do that, I... Turn down the suction power slightly on the suction machine, so just to see if I can get in with the big sucker. And I did up to this point, but thereafter I had to revert back to the fine end. And I'm just, you can see I'm moving it side to side as I am. I'm coming, trying to come away. The reason why I'm rocking it side to side is though the skin is still attached, the debris is attached to the ear canal wall. So by rocking it side by side, I'm detaching it from the sides of the ear canal. I've just gone back to the fine end. And you can just see how much more moist and damp this is. And it continuously blocks the probe. So 
on this occasion, factoring in the time I was in and out the ear, because when we when I show you the video back, I edit all the moments when I'm not in the ear. Uh, I don't edit anything else. Everything else is exactly what we do. Um, it comes up to about 17 and a half minutes of procedure, but when you factor in all the the time not spent in the year, it was just under half an hour, actually. So I, I did pretty well. Um, you will see at the end, there was a bit of debris left, but we had to leave that, unfortunately. Um, for two reasons, it, it wasn't going to affect the patient, but they also began, as I said earlier, they began to experience vertigo, which was, which can happen when you perform your wax removal. And I'll explain why that is. There is a couple of reasons why. When you've got an occlusion like this, when you've got such a severe blockage, it will create positive pressure um, in the space behind the wax in the eardrum that can push the eardrum inwards uh, and two things can happen actually it will one way or the other change the air pressure behind the uh, the eardrum in the middle ear but in some cases it can increase the pressure because if the eardrum is being pushed in the, the the volume of the middle ear is reduced so therefore the air pressure is increased Conversely, um, sometimes when the eardrum is pushed in, it can stimulate the eustachian tube, uh, the muscles can contract, and it can sometimes cause negative pressure. So the air can escape out of these, forced out of the eustachian tube. Um, so the muscles have got an involuntary contraction at certain air pressures. Um, so by increasing the pressure of the middle ear by to a certain amount, the muscles of the eustachian tube can contract, cause the eustachian tube to open, and air is forced out through the eustachian tube. So it can create negative pressure in the middle ear. And when you adjust the pressure in that manner, um, it can sometimes stimulate the organ of balance. It's more likely to occur if you have uh, a, a, a fistula of some sort. So a fistula um, is when... Uh, and the uh, the barrier between two, two different parts of the body as such is is breached so in the case of the ear um, in the organ of hearing uh, we have inner ear fluid there's two types there's endolymph and perilymph and one form of fistula is called perilymph fistula and that's when um, perilymph fluid escapes um, out of the organ of hearing via a structure called the round window and when you get a breach in that separation uh, between two distinct parts of the body in this case the inner ear and the middle ear it can in the case of the ear cause vertigo um, you can also get some patients also experience vertigo with due to pressure changes in the ear due to another condition called uh, a semi-circular uh, canal dehiscence so well, i discussed the organ of balance earlier the vestibular system and there's three semicircular canals at different angles different planes and one of them is called the superior uh, uh, semicircular canal and the organ of balance these semicircular canals uh, internally there's fluid and a jelly membranous layer and surrounding that is bone it's it's protected by the bone but that superior canal, uh, semicircular canal, the ring is facing upwards towards the, the brain, just below the dura. So the dura makes up um, the, the, the meninges. Uh, the meninges is, and the dura is a fluid that protects, it encapsulates the brain and it protects the brain. And when the bone is coating the semicircular canal it protects the inner portion of the semicircular canal from any pressure changes in the skull for example um, however in some cases the bone bony part of the superior canal dehiscence is eroded it can be due to a cholesteatoma so a middle ear disease an inner ear disease as well and it exposes the inner fluid membrane layer which then means vibrations can enter the organ of balance via that breach via that breach of bone that bone's no longer there uh, normally that bone will protect the the fluid inside the organ of balance from any external pressure changes but when that bone is eroded it's now exposed to external pressure ages so 
the simple motion of pushing air into your ear. So you've got a piece of cartilage on the outside part of the ear called the tragus. You can all feel that. And a simple act, and we call it the fissure test, the simple act of pushing that, tra- that tragus in and out um, to close the entrance of your ear, you're causing pre- waves of pressure to enter the ear canal through the eardrum. And those pressure changes can enter the organ of balance via that uh, semicircular canal dehiscence if the bone is eroded and breached, and it can make you feel dizzy. Quite often as well, people with the condition superior canal dehiscence, when they um, rock their eyeballs side to side, they can actually hear that. Now, normally we shouldn't be able to hear that, but in those patients who suffer from this condition, the vibrations uh, and sound created by the eyes being rolled side to side uh, travel um, across the, the dura, the meninges, and can enter the organ of balance by the dehiscence and those vibrations travel through the organ of balance and then stimulate the organ of hearing. So the organ of hearing, the cochlea and the organ of balance are actually connected. So that's a condition, condition called superior canal dehiscence. So um, there, that's a couple of reasons why you can get dizzy with, with wax. Another reason is um, the organ of balance is also affected by temperature. If the temperature is reduced of in the in one ear, um, it inhibits the function of the organ of balance in that ear, which means the brain receives different um, uh, signals from the right and left ear respectively, and it thinks you're moving when you're actually not. Um, conversely, if you increase the temperature in the ear, it excites the organ of balance in that particular ear, and that ear sends too many signals to the brain and again your brain gets confused because it thinks you're moving in a certain direction but you're not in the case of microsuction it cools the temperature in your ear it reduces the temperature so it inhibits the function and some people can get dizzy for that reason so there's a bit of debris just around the side but uh, we had to stop and the patient could hear 100 i hope you enjoyed that video guys take care keep well and speak soon